Welcome to MA3D1, the Warwick Max module on fluid mechanics. This video is about Lagrangian and Eulerian description of flow. In order to develop a theory of fluid flow, one needs a description of fluid motion and deformation. Uh, while there is no unique mathematical way for such a description, there are two approaches that are commonly used. They are called the Lagrangian and the Eulerian descriptions. Let's start with the Lagrangian description, which is named after a uh, French, Italian uh, astronomer and mathematician, Joseph Louis Lagrange. Uh, in this description, we apply a label to infinitesimal volumes of fluid. They're called material volumes because they move as the fluid moves. Okay. Uh, if you have a finite Lagrangian volume, a volume of a finite extent, then it is possible to follow that volume if you simply consider it as a collection of infinitesimal Lagrangian volumes that are contained within. And uh, if you know how each one of these infinitesimal volume moves, then you would then uh, deduce how the whole finite Lagrangian volume would move. There are many possible ways of uh, choosing a label to apply to fluid particles. Uh, the most common and perhaps the most convenient for mathematical purposes is to say that the label is simply the position vector of a particle at some reference time t naught. In order to illustrate uh, these ideas, let me show you a simple simulation and movie. So here I have drawn a flow that spirals out according to the black curves that are shown. Right? And at the location minus one comma one, this black dot shows an infinitesimal, shows the position of an infinitesimal fluid particle. So we are going to label this point according to, or this fluid particle according to its position at time t equals zero. And this label is minus one comma one because that's the coordinate. Those are the cord Cartesian coordinates of this point. Now, as time goes on, this particle moves with the flow. As you can see, it will follow this spiral pattern. But even after it moves, the label of this point, even after it has moved to different coordinates, its label is still minus one comma one. We are going to refer to this particle as minus one comma one because that's where it was at our reference time of t equals zero. In this way, the Lagrangian description focuses the attention on the material fluid instead of its location. This is to be contrasted with the Eulerian description, which is named after the Swiss mathematician Leonard Euler, which I assume most of you will be familiar with. Um, in the Eulerian description, the fluid particles are labeled by their current position. Uh, in this description, if you have a velocity field u of x comma t, where u is a vector and x is the vec uh, also a vector describing the location that a fluid particle is currently occupying, is occupying at time t, then u of xt is the speed with which this particle is moving. Now, it so happens that a little time later, another fluid particle will arrive at this location x, and then u of xt will describe the velocity of that fluid particle. In this way, in the Eulerian description, the attention is given to regions of space rather than uh, following the identity of the material fluid element. Why two different descriptions? Why can we not use a single description, uh, either the Eulerian or the Lagrangian 
or some other description. The reason is that we require two separate properties of these descriptions. The first property is that the description would conveniently represent the acceleration of a material fluid particle. This is so because we want to represent, uh, we want to apply Newton's law of motion on infinitesimal fluid particles. And to do that, we would like to find the acceleration um, because Newton's law, uh, second law of motion is uh, involves the acceleration. It says force is mass times acceleration. And uh, uh, this is convenient in the Lagrangian frame because if we know the velocity of the fluid particle in the Lagrangian frame, you simply take its time derivative, you get the acceleration of the fluid particle. But at the same time, application of Newton's law would require us to find the total force on the particle. And the force acting on the fluid particle partly also comes from its neighbors because the neighbors might push against the particle and thereby you know, that, that would contribute to a force that uh, we would account for. Unfortunately, characterizing the interaction with the neighbor is extremely complicated in the Lagrangian frame. To illustrate this, let me show you an uh, animation that I made uh, on a computer. Um, this is the uh, same flow that I showed you to illustrate the Lagrangian uh, label. But now I'm going to label a whole square of fluid particles with different colors. And uh, you can see to start with this blue neighbors the red and the purple, right? But now as the flow goes on, we are going to track uh, these volumes, in this case, the areas, and try to see what happens to those value, uh, volumes. Now, I started the simulation. Each fluid particle is now transported by the spiraling flow. And you will see the Lagrangian volumes start to distort, and they distort significantly. It is not necessary anymore that interfaces between fluid particles that started out flat, they remain flat. It is also not necessary anymore that the area of contact between fluid particles be preserved as they move with the flow. So the overall characterization of uh, identifying a characterization of the force of interaction with the neighbor is extremely complicated in the Lagrangian frame. And that's what motivates using the Eulerian frame. And uh, what the identification of uh, the neighbor, the neighboring particle, as well as the mechanical interaction with the neighboring particle is convenient in the Eulerian frame. We are going to see this a little later. So the two sides of the equation that uh, of the two sides of Newton's second law of motion, force is mass times acceleration, are conveniently written in these two different descriptions. Uh, that's why we need both of them. But to use both of them together, we need uh, to be able to translate from one to the other. And that's uh, the next topic. Let's see how the Eulerian to Lagrangian translation works. Uh, for this translation, uh, the Lagrangian description is going to be written by uh, the position of the Lagrangian particle labeled x at time t. This position we are going to denote capital F. And uh, from this position, it is straightforward to calculate the Lagrangian velocity u 
by simply differentiating the position with time. And the Eulerian uh, description is going to be described by the Eulerian velocity field u, which I described a little earlier. So to go from the Eulerian to the Lagrangian, to construct capital F from little u, uh, we need to solve a set of differential equations, where which equates the rate of change of f, which means the velocity of the fluid particle, to the Eulerian velocity of the fluid particle where at a location where the Lagrangian particle currently is. And this is a first order differential equation for f, so it needs one initial condition, and that initial condition is that uh, the Eulerian particle at the reference time is at a location given by its label. Forgot the underline here. To go backwards, to go from the Lagrangian to the Eulerian construction, uh, we assume that F is given, which means we know the position of the Lagrangian particles with time. And we use that to construct an inverse Lagrangian map, which means given the current position, uh, we can find where it came from. Okay. Uh, now, using this inverse Lagrangian map and the current velocity of uh, the fluid in, in the Lagrangian description, you simply take uh, the current position, invert using the Lagrangian map to find the Lagrangian label, and then find the velocity of that Lagrangian label at the current time to find the Eulerian velocity. We are now ready to take an important step in developing continuum theory of fluid flow, and that is the derivation of the material derivative. We will use this definition to uh, find the acceleration of the fluid in terms of the Eulerian description of velocity. To derive an expression for the material derivative, consider any material property C uh, expressed uh, as a function of the Eulerian label x and time t. We want the rate of change of C following the Lagrangian particle, but our description is given in terms of the Eulerian label. So we note that a simple conversion is possible by writing C as a function of the Eulerian, sorry, the Lagrangian location uh, of the particle labeled x. And now, uh, this field C is now a function of time in two different ways. It's because it's a function of time in the Eulerian sense, for fixed Eulerian label, uh, the field changes with time, but also that the field changes with time because the Lagrangian position of the particle for a fixed Lagrangian label is also a function of time. So when we differentiate this expression with time, naturally we get two terms from using the chain rule. And the, this process is carried out here. The two terms are written there. So the time rate of change of C following the Lagrangian particle is the time rate of change of C following the Eulerian label plus an additional term. This term is called the advection term. This derivation motivates the definition of a derivative called the material derivative. In fact, in the literature, it's given many different names, Lagrangian derivative, substantial derivative, total derivative, and there are others, but these will suffice for now. And this derivative is simply recognizing the operation that one has to carry out on an Eulerian field to find the Lagrangian rate of change without explicitly, explicitly converting back and forth between the Eulerian and Lagrangian descriptions. The uh, notation we will use is capital D by DT, and it will be equal to the partial with time plus the velocity 
dotted with the gradient acting on whatever field we want to find the material derivative of. And simply using this material derivative, now we can find the acceleration of the fluid to be the material derivative of the velocity, that is rate of change of velocity following the fluid particle. And that can be written in purely Eulerian terms as partial u partial t plus u dot grad u. We close this video with the statement of the Reynolds transport theorem. Consider a quantity capital B whose volumetric density is given by little b. So one can say that when you integrate little b over the volume of the fluid, let's say a volume omega as shown in this figure, you get the total quantity of capital B inside the volume. In many situations, one is interested in the rate of change of this quantity B occupied within the volume. For example, you could have capital B be the total momentum of the fluid inside the volume, and the rate of change of the total momentum must be equal to the external force. If you want to apply this principle, you want to find the rate of change of total momentum inside this volume. We will derive or write the expression for a general quantity B, not only momentum. So if omega is a Lagrangian volume, then we have to account for the fact that the volume is also changing with time before we find the time derivative. Which means when we calculate this integral, this integral now is a function of time for two reasons. One, because the density itself could be varying with time and that would give rise to the integral changing with time. Or we could have the uh, boundaries of the volume changing with time. If the volume occupies a different region of space where the density is different, the, obviously the integral is going to be different. Then the Reynolds transport theorem states that the rate of change of this integral and in fluid mechanics it is usually written with a material derivative to highlight the fact that we are letting the volume of integration change with time according to the motion of the fluid. Otherwise you can replace the time uh, material derivative there with simply the time derivative. They would mean the same thing if you understand what omega of t means. This rate of change comes uh, from two sources. The first is the Eulerian rate of change which means you simply integrate the rate of change of the density within the volume. That would be one reason why the total quantity would be changing. And the second is that the boundary of the volume is moving and as the boundary of the volume moves it brings in new fluid or maybe it spits out fluid at a rate given by u dot n dA. u is the Eulerian velocity of the fluid at that point. So as the volume changes this much amount of fluid is exchanged between the volume and the region outside. Multiply that by the volumetric density and you get the rate of change of exchange of this quantity B between the volume outside and the volume inside. And that also contributes to the rate of change of the integral. So this is the statement of Reynolds transport theorem. Um, many believe that this doesn't quite rise to the level of a mathematical theorem, but in fluid mechanics, that's the name it is given. So, and that's the name that has stuck. This concludes the section 2.4 in the notes on Lagrangian and Eulerian descriptions of flows. This is a particularly important topic. So please take your time to understand this topic because it has bearing on pretty much everything that is to come in this module. Uh, Thank you for your attention and I will see you in the next video or in the next lecture.